started with some uh, housekeeping items why we let people trickle on. Um, first of all, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to talk about PPP forgiveness. So if you're at the wrong one, maybe it's time to jump off. <laughs> it's okay. <We're> pretty boring. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> my name's Meredith Fickrell. I am a controller here at Upsourced Accounting, and um, I'm going to be the the monitor, MC. MC, MC moderator. I don't moderator. know any of the above. Mixture. Yeah. So housekeeping. Um, we're going to run a Q&A during um, the webinar. So you'll see a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can just pop in um, your questions as we go and we'll spend some time at the end answering those questions. Um, additionally, the webinar is being recorded and we will email out the uh, notes and the slide deck um, at the end. Yeah. All right, should we, should we get into it? Yeah, let's go ahead and get started. Sure. Um, today's speakers are Ryan Watson. Um, Ryan is a CPA and partner at Upsourced Accounting. Um, for those of you who don't know what Upsourced is, it's a digital first accounting firm focused on um, growth minded agencies. And we also have Josh Barrett with Matchstick Legal. Um, Josh is a, a lawyer and a recovering CPA and founder of Matchstick Legal, uh, where he advises creative agencies and uh, firms of all sizes. So, I didn't realize you, you selected my pre-quarantine picture there compared to <laughs> We'll have to update it. That's, uh, I do love the, right. the beard. By the way, I didn't know you were a recovering CPA. That's, I'm like yes. literally, literally learning this in the moment. Right. So that's good. That's right. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, uh, let's kick it off to Josh to get us started. Yeah. Um, so this means what it says on the tin. Um, these things are changing constantly. I think we will get a little bit more guidance uh, in the next few weeks. For some people, they're going to have to start, you know, their eight weeks will be up uh, in the next couple of weeks. So it is difficult. Uh, we don't have all the rules at the time we need them. And I think that's, we're, you know, sort of building this airplane in the air as we go. So uh, I think that's I think that's okay. You don't need to apply for forgiveness at the at the minute the eight weeks is up, uh, and so you can uh, maybe if there's some legislation pending or things going on, you can wait a little bit. Um, obviously, everything depends on your own unique situation. So check with your personal CPA or lawyer uh, to figure out the uniquenesses of your particular situation or something that you specifically want to try, but we think we'll cover a lot of uh, the situations in this presentation today about forgiveness. Okay. All right. Everybody probably knows uh, the basics of forgiveness. You've got this PPP loan. To the extent you spend it on qualifying expenses during the eight-week period following receipt of the loan, it will be forgiven. Qualifying expenses generally include payroll costs, um, broadly compensation, which is wages, salary, tips, those types of things, commissions, employer paid state and local taxes, employer paid health insurance costs, employer paid retirement benefits. Um, it also includes your rent and utility payments, interest on debt that you use to purchase property. And right now the rule is that 75% of your expenses have to go toward payroll costs. Uh, that 75% is one of the things along with the eight week period is one of the things that's under, um, they may be trying to change in the next round of legislation, but it has not been changed yet. So it's only been passed by the house and the Senate says they won't, they're not interested in undertaking it at this point. All right, what's next? All right, so about a week ago, actually, on a Friday night, uh, the Treasury dropped the forgiveness application, and in it, with all the instructions, we will send out a link to that at the end if you don't already have it. It's 11 pages long, and that's both the application and the uh, instructions, and the instructions had a bunch of new rules. So we're going to talk about some of those new rules and um, and then Ryan's going to go through some examples and apply the various rules so you can see how they work with actual numbers. So the first one, uh, I mentioned this eight-week period. A new rule is that you can choose 
certain um, businesses can choose an al alternative covered period. So instead of eight weeks from the date of the loan, if you have biweekly or weekly payrolls, you can choose an alternative covered period, which runs from the date of your first payroll after the loan is funded. So it could shift it uh, forward just a little bit. This, based on some of the other rules that we'll get into, this shouldn't really change um, how much money you can squeeze into the alternative period, uh, but it may provide some administrative convenience just for accounting purposes and not having to prorate payrolls. This is an election. Uh, we don't know how you make the election, probably on filling out this form, but there's not something specific, separate that you file. Um, uh, but it is something to look into if you have payrolls every two weeks or more frequently. If you have payrolls twice a month or less frequently monthly, this does not apply to you. All right, what's next? All right, this is probably the most important rule that's in the <clears throat> new application. And there was a lot of confusion about what expenses you could include toward forgiveness because the days you pay them don't necessarily fall within the eight-week period or the time period to which the payment applies may not entirely fall within the eight-week period. So I have two bullet points here to sort of explain it and then we'll look at some examples, some um, illustrations that may help understand it. So any check you write during your covered period or, or alternative period if you elect that, even if the payment relates to a time prior to the covered period apply. So if you, if your covered period begins on April 30th and you have a payroll on April 30th that, re that relates to all of April, that's entirely included. Uh, and then the second point is that payments made after the covered period, like your first payroll after the covered period, qualify for forgiveness to the extent the payment relates to the time within the covered period. Um, and we'll look at an illustration of that because it's a little confusing and it's a little different for something like payroll, which is paid in arrears after the money is earned versus rent, which is paid in advance of when the obligation is due. Um, a couple quick notes here. Bonuses are okay. So if you find that you have some extra bucks and you want to reward your staff, uh, bonuses are okay, subject to some of the $100,000 limitations that Ryan's going to talk about. Because of this incurred and paid rule, we've gotten a lot of questions. Can I prepay payroll? Um, the answer then was no, and based on this incurred and paid rule, the answer is no. You can't really prepay payroll, um, but you shouldn't need to in this case. Uh, prepaid interest is specifically prohibited. That's a pretty narrow exception but we don't see anything that seems to prevent prepaid rent uh, in these rules. Uh, but remember, you're still subject to that 75-25 rule, so your priority should be in sending the money out the door for payroll. So let's take a look at a couple illustrations. All right, <clears throat> so here you can see the eight week covered period and how the payrolls are falling that first payday uh, because it falls within the eight week period is fully applied toward forgiveness, even though the time period, the payroll period uh, has some time prior to uh, the eight week covered period. Obviously that second payday does uh, is fully within the covered period and incurred during the covered period. And then that last payroll, you'll see it falls outside the covered period. Uh, it's the first payroll outside the covered period. Uh, so only the time within the, the time the payroll is incurred within the covered period applies. So super confusing, but I thought, I mean, the graphic helped me understand it. So uh, hopefully it helps you. So let's take a situation with rent. Now, remember this is paid, <clears throat> rent is paid in advance rather than in arrears. So the idea of when it's incurred is a little different. So take a look at that first pay period. Maybe that's March 1st, you pay your rent. That's not within the covered period. You don't get to claim any of that, even though some of the time relates to the covered period. Second payroll fully within the covered, or the second rent payment fully within the covered period, um, uh, fully can be fully applied toward forgiveness and same with rent period 
see, even though part of it, the stub of it, applies to a time period after the eight week session. Um, so that's a unique difference, but it's sort of the inverse of what we saw with payroll. Now, many of us um, have been negotiating with our landlord and maybe are in a situation with deferred rent and are not paying rent. So you could have a situation where maybe you're not paying rent right now. And so here's an example of where maybe your rent prior to the covered period is deferred. You didn't write any rent check. It's deferred again, deferred again. And then after the eight week period, you write a check that covers all that prior rent. Um, this is more like the first instance we saw with payroll where you're paying something in the first pay period or the first payment due date after the covered period and it relates to time periods within the covered period. So this is a situation where you could pay rent after the fact and it could be applied toward forgiveness. So keep those, we'll send this PDF out after the fact, but those examples um, should help with your forgiveness planning. I think if you are in a deferred rent situation or you do want to prepay rent, that's a good example of where you should talk to your individual CPA um, or lawyer to make sure it works within your personal forgiveness planning. <clears throat> the application introduced a few exceptions to the, um, there's a rule that says if your staff, if your headcount goes down during the covered period, then maybe the amount of your loan uh, that is eligible for forgiveness will be reduced. The loan's not reduced, but just the amount that can be forgiven. Uh, the application introduced a few more exceptions in addition to the one in the statute. The statute says if you restore uh, FTEs by June 30th, then those aren't counted against you for forgiveness purposes. Uh, the, <clears throat> these other bullet, bullet points were new exceptions added in the application. So if an employee is terminated for cause, if they voluntarily resigned, went and got a new job or did something else, an employee that voluntarily requested a reduction in hours that was granted, and then an employee that maybe was laid off previously, you extended a bona fide written offer to return to work and the employee said, no, thank you. So in each of those cases, those types of reductions in headcount will not count against you. I will say that cause is not defined. And I know a lot of terminations um, in this time were a mix of not enough work. Maybe that person was probably the weak link in the chain anyway. Um, because cause is not defined, I think you can t be um, reasonably aggressive with that if you had reasons in addition to the fact that there was probably not as much work um, for terminating someone. I would think that that would be a reasonable place. Uh, that would be reasonable to call that a cause termination if that helps with your FTE calculations. Can we jump on a question that goes along sure. with that? Um, what documentation do you suggest having um, to prove cause and um, even if the, the employee decides to cut back their hours, what type of documentation do we need? Um, let's take the second part first. So in the case that someone voluntarily requested, uh, probably just emails um, would be sufficient for this. The application, the last page of the application has detailed rules about exactly the documents that are needed in order to apply for forgiveness and as well as some optional um, documents. Uh, this, your specific question is not addressed in those rules if I recall correctly because it just says you need to provide documentation that evidence. Right, right, so an email would be fine in, um, in my estimation. And what was the other, the first part of that question? Um, it was what documentation would we need to provide for cause? So if you were- For cause. Yeah, you know, gosh, I don't know. Um, I think you're in a little bit of a, um, someone asked me if, if the fact that you reported to, you know, unemployment that someone was let go just for, um, 
just for hours if that would sort of undermine a determination of cause. Um, I think it's possible, but I think that's if if your loan is less than two million bucks, you're not an investigation target, and I wouldn't worry about it too much. I don't think the banks are in sync with the unemployment department or anything that was filed with the unemployment department. And, you know, the far forms that you file with unemployment um, aren't, you know, aren't everything, right? You have additional information. Right. Um, so I don't have a good answer for that. Um, your internal documentation of what you put in your employee file would be part of that. And, um, you're going to make a determination of why someone is determinated, terminated, and um, you know record that in their employee file, and it's going to be lack of work and also um, performance issues. That sounds like cause to me. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, we can hit these pretty quickly because I think Ryan's going to touch on some of them in his examples. But um, one of the qualifying expenses is rent. The application made clear that that's both your premises, your real property and personal property. So uh, if you're leasing uh, a bunch of computers, um, I guess there might be a few people that have a copy machine that they might be leasing. Those uh, rent expenses do qualify. Um, we already talked about not being able to prepay interest on mortgage debt, but mortgage debt is described as debt to purchase either real property or personal property. So that was clarified a little bit well, as well. Um, one um, unique thing probably to a lot of the people on this call is recall there's a rule that says you cannot claim for forgiveness um, more than, if, if someone makes more than $100,000 a year, you can only claim for forgiveness the pro rata portion of up to 100,000. They added a rule that said that owner salary is capped at the greater of 2019 or 2020. And the reason is to prevent owners from juicing their salary and just getting paid more with PPP money. So it's a little bit of a look back. And if your salary was lower in 2019, that may be the basis for determining the extent of uh, owner salary forgiveness. Um, I, it was a big thing in the nose. The IRS decided that these amounts that you spend on rent and payroll are not deductible currently for tax purposes, which means you will have more taxable income at the end of the year. So you need to plan for that. And maybe that means additional withholdings um, or stick a little bit in the savings. This is also an item that's under discussion for change in legislation, but it hasn't gotten there yet. I'm going to leave all the fancy FTE calculations to Ryan. Uh, and um, <laughs> be sure and take a look at the, the documentation that is, like I said, there's a section of required documents and there's a section of optional documents. Um, it may be that, you know, there's no timeline for when you have to apply for forgiveness. You probably won't be able to apply the minute you're eight weeks end because you need things like your 941, your payroll report, which is filed quarterly. So you may finish your eight week period you know, in the middle of May, and then have to wait till the end of the quarter and the preparation or estimation of your 941 in order to uh, apply for forgiveness. So, uh, but once you do apply, the bank has, is it 30 days or 60 days, Ryan, to give you an answer? Yeah, that's a good question. You know what? We'll have to check the application during this. I don't recall off the top right. of my head. I wanted to it's say 30, 30 days. or 60 days. Yeah, but, I so think 30. It's but... a reasonable <laughs> amount of time. We'll have somebody take a look during this and we'll so talk. I'll I'm gonna hand it off to Ryan. He's got a bunch of examples to run through to help oh Meredith question. has some questions. <laughs> Do yeah. partnership draws qualify under owner salary? Um there are special rules for how you report partnership draws. If you are a um if if you mean you're a, a real partnership, um an LLC taxed as a partnership, that's handled differently than if you are an S corporation that takes both salary and distributions or draws. Um, and so Ryan can talk a little bit about that, but yes, um, mm -hmm. in certain situations, um, you know, guaranteed payments uh, and draws for partners do qualify as compensation yeah. that is eligible for forgiveness. Yep, yeah, that's that's right. And um, you know, I I, I believe uh, the the uh, clarification around how partners would be treated 
for the purpose of the loan amount was clarified to suggest that your self-employment income, sort of your full K-1 self-employment income would be, would count, which of course is ir irrespective of whether you took it as a draw or not. And I haven't seen anything to the contrary. So I would expect some version of that would be the same as your forgiveness. So yeah. um, I guess it's a roundabout way of saying that your, your guaranteed payments may actually not matter in that case. And it'll be more driven by your self-employment income. But one, okay, other so quick note, one other okay. quick note right. I wanted to mention, um, a lot of what we've talked about applies to uh, agencies with employees and staff. Um, if you are a freelancer, um, even though there's this 11 page application about two thirds of it or three quarters of it doesn't apply to you, you'll fill out about six of the lines instead of 26. Um, and it'll be based on your Schedule C data. And you may not have rent expense and you may not have utilities if you work out of your house, for example. Um, but this is right now, this is the same application, even though it's completely overkill for a freelancer situation. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so let's get into uh, some the, the payroll component of this, right? So obviously, Josh gave us a pretty good overview of the mechanics and some of the new rules for all costs. Obviously, the lion's share of your forgiveness. Uh, not less than 75% <laughs> is gonna be related to payroll. Um, and so obviously Josh you know, kind of gave a refresher around what payroll costs qualify, compensation, employer benefits, state and local taxes, those sorts of things. And, and I would say generally speaking, if your business did not have either a reduction in staff or a reduction of individual salaries or hourly wages, this calculation is somewhat more straightforward. It ends up being, you know, somewhat of a compilation exercise to fill out the tables. If you did, as many of our clients and many folks just generally have a reduction in staff or salary, the, 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 um, this, this application gets a little trickier. There are a, a number of exceptions. And so again, some of those general exceptions relate to uh, the cat, the extent to which you can, forgive cash compensation. So again, that is $100,000 on an annualized basis. Said differently, 15385 is the max that you can have forgiven for any individual. I mentioned the fact that if you had a reduction in FTEs, that may have an impact on your forgiveness amount. Similarly, with a reduction to wages, that may have an impact on your forgiveness amount. And finally, just a note, we did talk about this difference between partnerships and sole proprietors from corporations and S corps, if you are a partnership in a, uh, excuse me, a partner in a partnership or a sole proprietor, the amounts you paid for benefit and retirement would not qualify for forgiveness. At that case, it's, it's just your cash compensation, your self-employment. So given those exceptions, particularly around what happens if you reduce your FTEs or you reduce your wages, let's get into some specific examples. So first of all, this is the actual application or I should say one of the 11 pages of it, uh, we will Slack or, or we'll put in the notes and email out a link to the formal application if you've not already seen it. But ultimately, these, this is where you're going to be putting the majority of your payroll information for forgiveness. And as we go through the exercises, we'll show you where the information goes and how it kind of gets filled out. So of the two ways, that your forgiveness amount would be affected, reducing your salaries or reducing your FTEs, we'll hit the first one, reducing your salaries. And so in order to determine whether or not I need to reduce my amount eligible for forgiveness because I took somebody's salary down, uh, I've gotta go through these steps. So obviously the first step is saying, what's the base period? So if I reduce my salary or if I reduced an employee's salary First question is compared to when, right? Compared to when, then of course, once I figure that out, we compute whatever the average salary is. And if it is, if there is a reduction, then we'll have to calculate what that is. So step one, what is the base period? So with regard to determining whether somebody's salary has been reduced, the base period is simply the first calendar quarter of 2020. The, the average salary of an individual from January 1st to March 31st, 2020, as compared to that, the same individual's average salary or average hourly wage 
during your eight week covered period. So in an example, let's say you are an agency that had uh, in lieu of or in addition to uh, layoff, you reduce certain individual salaries. So let's take employee number one, uh, during the calendar quarter, or the first calendar quarter of the year, that individual had an annual salary of $65,000, but because of the crisis, you reduced that individual salary to $45,000. So the first question is, is that person now making at least 75% of what they were making before? Or in other words, did I reduce their salary by 25% or more? If they're making at least 75% of what they were making before, you can stop. There is no reduction in your forgiveness, that's okay. However, if you reduce their salary or average hourly rate by more than 70, by more than 25%, so in this example, this individual who is now making 45 and previously made 65, they're now making 69% of what they were making. In that case, uh, there may be a reduction in forgiveness. We have to keep going. So in this case, in order to determine the amount of forgiveness reduced, the calculation is kind of convoluted, but it works like this. You take their base period, what they were making originally, you multiply that by 75%. So in this case, you take that $65,000 that they were making, you multiply it by 75%. So that number is 48,750 you subtract away what they are now making in the covered period. So in this case, it's $45,000. The difference is the annual reduction amount. That's the, the, the amount of potential uh, reduction. Now that obviously relates to a full year of that person's salary. We're of course only asking for forgiveness for an eight week period. So what I have to then do is take that person's $37.50 multiply by eight, divide by 52 to get to an eight week amount. And in this case, it is $576 and 92 cents. And so ultimately then what I would do is I would take this person, how this would then sort of flow into the table. When I'm listing this individual's compensation for which I want forgiveness, of course, I'm going to get their name and their identification. And I'm going to put in, here's how much cash compensation I gave them for the eight weeks. And in the case of $45,000 over eight weeks, that's roughly $6,900. However, over here in this column, I'm gonna list the amount by which I have to reduce that because of this sort of reduction penalty. And so then in the end, I would only get forgiveness for their $6,900 less than $577. So that's how that works. Now, the second possible way that your forgiveness would be reduced is if you reduce the overall FTEs in your organization. Now, if the last, if the salary thing was a little bit confusing, this is even a little bit more <laughs> confusing. The process is still roughly the same, right? I've got to determine, okay, if I'm saying that I reduced my, my company's full-time equivalents, the first question is compared to when, and then based on that, we can do the, the uh, calculation. Now, the difference around FTEs is that unlike wages, which, which was just compared to the first quarter of the year, for FTEs, I can select the base period. And that's, of course, because businesses are different. Employees fluctuate for any variety of reasons. And so to provide some flexibility, um, the SBA has given us some choices. So my first choice is last year, roughly. So the period of February 15th to, to June 30th of last year, what were my FTEs over that period? Option two being the first two months of this year. So January 1st to February 29th of 2020. And then if I am a seasonal business, I've got even more flexibility where I can just pick an eight week period of time between May 11th and September 15th of 2019. So if I were to take an example, let's say I'm not a uh, seasonal business. I'm running an agency where I had seven F average FTEs last year. I had three and a half in the first two months of this year. And over my eight week period of time, I've got an average FTE of two and a half. So I can choose which reference period I want to use. And in this case, I'm going to choose the first two months of the year. The whole goal here is for the reduction in FTEs to be the smallest or to be zero, right? So I'm going to choose, of course, the smallest number, which would be option two. 
So first question is, what's the base period? The second question is, how do I calculate FTEs? Right? So if I'm a company and all I do is employ full-time workers, obviously this is pretty straightforward, right? Each full-time worker is a full-time equivalent. But if I employ hourly workers, I have to determine how do I convert them to an FTE. So let's take another example. Let's say at my company, over that base period, the first two months of the year, I've got five people working for me as employees. Two of them are full-time and three of them are part-time putting in 30 hours a piece. Let's say moving into my eight week covered period, one of my two full-time folks were terminated and my three part-time individuals went from 30 hours a week to 10 hours a week. So the question is, how many FTEs does that mean I have in the base period or the covered period? And in this case, I have options too. So my first option is divide by 40. I think that's kind of the way that a lot of us would have intuitively done it. So obviously my full-time individuals in my base period are just ones, but my three part-time people are each 0.75 FTEs, right? 30 hours divided by 40 hours, they're each a 0.75. Using that same methodology in the covered period, I still have one FTE for my remaining full-time worker. I have zero for the person that was terminated. And then for my three part-time workers, they would now be 0.25 FTEs, 10 hours divided by 40 hours. So in this example, I would have gone from 4.25 FTEs to 1.75 FTEs. But I have another option. The other option is this simplified method, which basically just says if they're full-time, they're one. And if they're not, they're 0.5, regardless of how many hours they work part-time. So if I take that same group of people over the base period, of course, still my full-time workers are, are ones, but my three part-time workers are 0.5, right? They're not full-time, so they're 0.5 taking the same methodology to the covered period. My full-time person, of course, is still one. My terminated employee is still zero. My three part-time workers who are working fewer hours are still 0.5. So in this case, I would have gone from three and a half FTEs on the, on the base period to two and a half FTEs on the covered period. And in this case, I would choose option two again, right? I wanna show the smallest reduction or no reduction at all of FTEs. So I would pick option two and how I would choose to measure my FTEs. Okay, so now that we figured out how many FTEs I have and which base period I'm using, the calculation is mostly straightforward, right? So in this case, I've got two and a half in the covered period. I have three and a half in the base period. So my ratio or my reduction quotient is 0.71. And so when I'm filling out my table one of these employees, I'm using those F average FTE, those FTE amounts in this sort of column over here to the right. I'm coming up with 2.5. One quick note, Josh mentioned a few exceptions to a terminated employee where you wouldn't have to take a ding for lack of a better word on the fact that that individual is no longer working. So, if employee number two, for instance, who's no longer working with us in the covered period, that individual was terminated for cause, voluntarily resigned, or you terminated them, you gave them a good faith offer and they rejected it, you can put a number one here in this bottom left-hand corner, FTE reductions. And for the purpose of how many FTEs you have, you can add those two together. So if that individual was terminated for cause, I'd put a one in this box, I'd then have three and a half FTEs, and I wouldn't have any FTE reduction at all. So that's just a note on how that would work. But in my example, we'll say we just terminated that person. We didn't try to hire them back. We only have two and a half. And so when I'm, when I'm filling out the application, there is this section here around the FTE reduction. And ultimately, my, my quotient here is 0.71, which just essentially means that because of my FTE reduction, I'll only be eligible for 0.71 uh, against or 71% of my maximum amount of potential forgiveness. Okay, so those were two ways that your max forgiveness would be reduced, but there is a safe harbor that Josh did allude to. And so the idea around the safe harbor is to say, okay, you're in a situation where you've reduced your staff 
or you've reduced an individual's salary, if that reduction was a result of the crisis, okay, if it was, if it came after this economic downturn, and then you reinstated them by June 30th, you would not have to take a reduction in forgiveness. All is forgiven. And so the way they determine that is to say, okay, well, let's look at February 15th, right? So if, if over your, if, if on February 15th, you had more people than you did from the, from the period February 15th to April 26th, meaning your reduction happened after February 15th, and then you re reinstated all those individuals, all is good. So we'll take that example. So again, remember in our previous example, we had three and a half folks during our base period and we reduced them. If I still had the three and a half people on March, or I'm excuse me, on February 15th, and after that date is when I reduce my staff, and then by June 30th, I hire that one person back, all is, all is forgiven. Similarly, in that example with that employee whose salary we reduced, if their salary was 65,000 on February 15th, and I didn't reduce it until after February 15th, and then I reinstated their salary on June 30th, there is no reduction, Josh and Ryan are partying. And so the way this comes together on your application is you remember for that first individual whose salary we reduced, we originally had a reduction there of 576, but if I reinstate their salary, we come through and make that a zero. Similarly, we had a reduction for our FTEs, but if we reinstate all our individuals, we come through and make this a, a, a 1.0, in which case we don't have any reduction. So I know that was pretty meaty and we might have some questions about that, but that's ultimately how the nuances of the payroll calculation and the reductions would work. So I'll pause there. I'll kick this to Meredith. What kind of questions do we have? Yeah, so um, if we let an FTE go with cause and then hire an FTE in a different role, uh, would that net even for FTEs, is that correct? You don't have to hire back in the same specific- It doesn't have to, I, I, it wouldn't have to be the same individual. In fact, I, again, correct me if you disagree, Josh, but I think you get an exception for the individual terminated for cause and that would be theoretically incremental to the other individuals who would be their own average FTEs. So you might have grown in FTEs. Obviously, you don't get extra credit for that, but um, I think- Yeah, that's, that's right. It doesn't have to be the same person. It doesn't have to be the same role. Um, these FTE calculations, there's nothing in the rules that seem to look at the, the title, the role the person was hired for. So, um, yeah, the, those distinctions shouldn't matter. Are we listing W-2 paid owner of an S-Corp um, on this employee list? So are W-2 S-Corp owners considered employees? They are on the, so in the application, there's a grid where you provide a bunch of detail regarding the employees and the owners are not listed there. They get their own separate line just for compensation. And it's because they wanna to highlight to make sure that rule I said about the look back period 2019, 2020, they wanna make sure that that's uh, called out separately. So they will not be in that grid and the instructions make that clear. So when you get in there, it tells you what goes yeah. in this grid and what goes on a separate line. Okay. Um, another person, I have three and a half FTEs that hasn't changed throughout 2019 and into 2020, but they do have a number of 1099 contractors. Can I use the documentation of my 1099 contractors to qualify for more coverage and be forgiven when I pay them? So can you pay your 1099 contractors out of your pool of PPP money? Yep, that's nope. a no. Yep, that's a simple answer, unfortunately. Um, okay, and then um, several questions on uh, severance. I don't know if you guys wanna hit it now or wait until um, the end, but uh, is severance pay considered incurred at the time of termination or when paid? So essentially, like, can people get forgiveness when they're paying out severance and PTO um, to terminated employees? Yes, severance and PTO 
are eligible payroll costs, the timing could matter. Like um, if it's if it's paid more than, you know, if it, if someone was laid off or terminated, um, and you write the severance check during the covered period, then it's certainly going to be fine. If they were laid off and you came to the agreement regarding severance during the covered period and you pay it in the first pay period after, I think that's gonna be okay. But if you pay it like four months in the future, I think that's gonna be a problem under the incurred or paid rule. I think you're right. That's not right, Ryan? It sounds right to me. And the other thing, of course, would be that you're limited to the 15000 in compensation for any individual. And so if you've got a multi-month severance agreement, then certainly some of that may be limited. But Yes. Uh, Meredith, I saw, I saw one question uh, as to whether this, will, this recording is, will be available, like to stream after the fact. I don't I don't know the, I know all the materials will be. Yeah, we're gonna send out, um, for anyone that missed that, we're gonna send out the recording and the slide deck um, and any questions that we haven't answered, we'll send all of that information out in a follow-up email, um, either later today or beginning of next week. Um, okay, and then I think the only other question on FTEs, uh, do employment level rules only apply to full-time employees and not part-time employees? Ryan, you covered that, right, in your example? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I'm not entirely sure I, uh, and this could be worth just taking offline if I, I perhaps haven't understood the um, what we mean by employment level rules. But yeah, I think in determining how many FTEs I have, I think that's probably the nature of the question. Like, is it a, do I use 30 hour base or 40 hour? And, you know, through the example, again, you can either use 40 hours or the simplified method. Um, but if I've misunderstood understood that question, then um, certainly whoever answered, whoever asked it, feel free to email us. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we've hit on most of these. Any questions? I know we had a number of questions that came in um, from folks who, as they were signing up. Yeah. I don't know what. Um, oh, yeah. Let's take a look at those. Do you want to pull those there up, Meredith? Yeah, one of them, the one question was, do short-term and long-term disabilities qualify under the insurance category? We think the answer is no. We think no. Yeah, we think no. Uh, there's at least one public payroll company that, well, I shouldn't say not publicly traded, but one payroll company has come out and, and excluded that from their reporting and has suggested no, and we agree with that. Okay. Um, and then I know several questions, I think we answered a few of them along the way, but around uh, utilities. So um, under the utilities category, it mentions transportation. What all does this cover? Mainly I wanna make sure we um, include anything to do with our parking and parking reimbursements. Um, yeah, I don't think um, transportation includes parking or parking reimbursements. There, this has not been defined. The, mo the most clarification I've seen is that transportation is like fuel and maintenance for company owned vehicles. Um, Gosh, though, if you had a um, like a 125 plan or something or did parking reimbursements um, or transit passes, gosh, I'd really like for those to be That's covered. fringe, yeah. We'd have to look at that. Um, I mean, the, the interesting thing on many of these is that they're likely to be moot, right? Like we're likely to have achieved forgiveness already by the sheer nature of hitting the payroll costs and, and rent and utilities and sorts of things. But I'd probably say let's look at it if you're if you're in one of those uh, like you said 125 plans, um, and we'll, we could t we could take a look. So what about I know like a, several of our clients have um, you know, reimbursed people they're working at home they're using internet they've reimbursed for um, their internet expense Is, would that be an eligible expense to be covered? Like, yeah, I like that. Um, mm -hmm. I just, I guess the, the documentation I mean, I, piece might get a little bit tricky. Yeah. Um, Depends in part on how they're, how they're, I'm assuming it's, uh, they're, it's, they're not treating it, they're not taxing it. I'm, I'm assuming it's a. Payroll reimbursement. I think in the case, uh, like I would, you know, again, 
<laughs> keep in mind, we're looking at an 11 page document and we're trying to extrapolate that over all manners of circumstances. <laughs> I'm with Josh. I think in uh, sitting in front of an application, practically, I'm going to try to include that. Again, the documentation is something we'd have to think through. Um, again, one thing I think Josh said at the top is that while we have this 11 page application, we have yet to see what we got for the first round, which was a bunch of FAQs and some clarifications, and we may still. So some of this is subject to change, but I'd want to include that on the application. Okay. Well, and the, the, the other thing is that the, the statute delegates a bunch of the decision-making authority to the banks. And we think it's very likely that different banks could come up with different answers to that thing. Yeah. The, right. the, the banks are allowed to make their own judgment about what documentation is required, um, what's included, what's excluded, subject to certain um, statutory limits. But if a certain bank can, decides that 125 or parking reimbursements or internet reimbursements or phone plan reimbursements constitute utilities, great. But another bank may not, and that it is within their discretion to interpret that. So um, if you have a local community bank, and a, a person that's a banker that you can ask questions to, um, the banks are developing their policies about those things right now. If you have a giant bank and don't have a person to talk to, you'll probably have to wait until they publish something mm -hmm. um, on their webpage. Um, banks are expected, but not required, to turn this application into uh, a web portal of some sort where you'll answer it and upload stuff. Um, and then it'll go through some sort of review process. So I would expect, hope, that more uh, answers are provided there. Yeah. Um, uh, and I guess I should also say, like, if you, if we don't have an answer and the bank's guidance is uh, ambiguous, um, if you include your parking reimbursements and apply for it, um, you're not going to get in trouble if it turns out that that's not the case. They may just totally. qualify that particular expense, but you're not going to get in trouble. You're not going to go to jail. Nobody on this phone call is going to get in trouble if they made a mistake, if they applied for too much money. If you have money left over, you just pay it back or keep it as a loan at 1% for two years, which isn't great, but it's you know pretty good rate. Um, uh, I guess I, I've been surprised by the amount of questions I've gotten where people have said, Josh, um, you know, I accidentally took out too much money or I saw these rules about people having to give it back. And I'm, if you're under $2 million in loan, I'm here to tell you, don't worry about it. Don't use it fraudulently, but don't worry about it. And making a mistake, a genuine mistake, uh, after, you know, consulting with experts and reading a bunch of articles and reading the rules and following as best you can, that's not fraud. You're not going to get in trouble. No one's going to come knock on your door in the middle of the night. Um, so don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. You, you also brought up a really good point because I think um, I, the first round of applying for the loan was riddled with this really high stakes emotion because it was a race. And so one right. of the things we were all very worried about making a mistake, not necessarily because it would be construed as fraud, but because it might delay our ability to get the money and we'd be shut out. Obviously, that dynamic has completely changed for the purpose of forgiveness. There is no deadline. As Josh mentioned, you're likely to have to wait anyways. And so, again, the, the risk of making a mistake that might result in some back and forth with your, with your lender, far less. And so I would be much more inclined to be a little bit more liberal within the sort of spirit of what's written. And as Josh said, worst case, we decide that it's stricken and we have to you know, revise the application. That's no problem. That's no problem. Uh, a couple of questions that came in that sort of related to this that came in prior to the presentation. I think someone asked, is there still time to get in the queue for dollars? And yes, um, yep. they have not used up the second allocation of funds. Um, another question was, does the PPP increase your chance of being audited? And unless you have, unless you receive more than 2 million bucks of loan, I'm going to say no. No. Um, I suppose you could, um, um, you could fill out your tax returns or something so 
incorrectly that you know raises a flag but that's independent of ppp the so PPP. i'm yeah. going to just say a hard i'm going to say yeah, a hard, hard no. No. getting the ppp does not increase your chance of getting uh audited audited the the um I, there's also a couple that that were trickling in from the group while we were chatting uh and i'm, married, I'm just gonna hit them real fast because i can read them and say them so one was um the, the there was a question around owner salaries was capped at the greater of 19 or 20 is it also capped at the 15 yes um there was a question around base period for comp um there is no choice in the base period for determining whether you've reduced somebody's comp it is the first calendar quarter of 2020 um you know bonuses paid in q1 are they excluded in any way i would say it's all about the covered period so if if a portion of your covered period included these bonuses and they were paid during the covered period, I think you're good. If the bonuses were paid prior to your cover period, then uh, I would say they're not good. Um, th there was also a question around EIDL, which is a really good reminder. And you might've had this in your, your notes, uh, Josh, but the EIDL grant is subtracted from your total forgiveness. So it is not on top of, it is, treated as sort of a, an advance against your PPP forgiveness. Yeah. Good one. Good reminder. Um, uh, I like this question. Uh, someone asked if, if you had to place a bet, do you think the eight week period for forgiveness will be extended? Um, well, how much am I betting and what are, what's the payout? Um, uh, I think it will be. But it may yeah. not be soon. Well, and the other thing I would add, again, who knows? I also agree. I would be actually personally surprised if it wasn't. Though, it might, and we don't know, it could come with some stipulations like the eight weeks is extended if you were affected by shutdowns. If your business was unable to open, and if your business was able to open, then no, right? So there, there, are, there is a chance that it might get extended but would be irrelevant for many of our clients. But that's just a total speculation. Yeah. I, I think generally speaking, Congress is um, not super interested in, um, in, in, in not being perceived as supportive of the PPP. I think it's sort of this broadly uh, popular thing with, in the small business community. And I think so far they've been pretty supportive. So I, I could see that getting extended. The 25% though, I, I actually would be surprised if that got changed, but we'll see. Uh, one of the questions from prior to was if if your plan is to only use the forgivable amount of the loan, when do you recommend paying oh. back the rest of the loan? If you intend not to use it right after requesting forgiveness, after forgiveness is granted within the first six months, um, if you don't plan to use it, uh, give it back the first time your bank will take it because it avoids accrual of interest. Remember that forgiveness does not apply to accrued interest, which won't be very much, but um, yeah. just don't create a situation where you have to write an actual check under any circumstance that's not, you know, this free, this free money. Um, so I would give it back straight away unless you wanted to hedge your bets against, you know, this, we're all going to be living in a weird world for a long time. And I think we're in a bit of a PPP honeymoon period, um, but the recovery <laughs> is going to be Long. Very long, um, yeah. and a little extra cash on hand uh, at a low interest rate. That's not doesn't have a personal guarantee or anything attached to it. Um, is you know not a bad long term uh, strategy. I um, I have to wholeheartedly agree with you. I, I really I mean again you know what we have been advising our clients is one percent is. Um, unprecedentedly low. It's it's a rounding error. It's, that is your annual <laughs> interest rate. So unless there's a really really compelling reason or whatever, uh, hang on to it. Uh, it. It provides optionality for almost no money. Yeah. Uh, somebody asked before if we were thinking of getting rid of our office at the end of June and wanted to see if changing the address would cause any issues with accounting for the PPP. I don't think so, Can't see um, except I will say that, you know, you're dealing with your bank and changing account related information with your bank um, is always an act of Congress on its own. Um, but that's where, 
you know, you need to make sure that information gets pushed through, but I don't think it's going to create an issue. Yeah, I think, I mean, you did bring up an interesting point, which is I do think there is some wisdom in reducing the amount of um, significant changes. Again, I think the address is a pretty simple one, but I've had folks who have asked about changes in org structure. So they were a, 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 a partner in a partnership and at some point during their covered period, they'd, they'd reclassify as an S-corp owner. Not to say that that would affect your ability to get forgiveness, but it sure would make it a whole lot more complicated. <laughs> and so uh, not, you know, notwithstanding any compelling reasons to the reverse, I'd probably not do that. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, yeah. Somebody asked if every dollar from the loan has to be documented with the bank or only the forgiveness amount. And the answer is only the forgiveness about. I think there's something specific in the application about that. But um, yeah, if you don't want to seek forgiveness for it, you're not, you know, if you want to spend it on something else that doesn't qualify for forgiveness, knock yourself out. You do not need to provide any documentation regarding the use of those funds to the bank. Anything else? Uh, I know we're, we're bumping in our up last couple of minutes. Time here. Um, any other questions that we've maybe we skipped over, haven't answered, we'll, we'll send a follow-up email and, and include those responses in there. Um, anything else from the audience in our last minute or so? Uh, so? Real quick, it looks like somebody asked how long we have until to, till we submit the forgiveness application. I'm not aware of a deadline. I don't know about you, Josh. No, no deadline. Um, there's no deadline. Um, I looked up that one specifically. Like I said, the bank has 30 or 60 days after they get your application. But remember, interest is accruing. You have an incentive to get it done early, but there's they're going to be, um, especially in early days, they're going to be slammed because a lot of people's eight-week periods that got their loans right away, those are mostly bigger businesses. Um, but if you're getting, if you've gotten your loan in the last two weeks, the the pace is slowed. But I think the banks especially at the beginning, you know, they've never done this. Um, and they're going to be slow at the beginning. I think they'll improve their procedures over time and get better. Um, but it's going to be slow to start with. Um, but as soon as you apply, that cuts off the time period for accrual of interest. Yeah, I think that sounds good. All right. So I think that's it, Meredith. You want to tell everybody how they can get in touch with uh, us or Josh and the Matchstick team? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you both Ryan and Josh for um, being hosting and presenting to us today. I think it was super informative. Um, if anyone would like to hear more about Josh, you can check him out at matchstick.legal. Um, you can sign up for a newsletter and they have a free uh, contract report card to, to get started. Um, and then with Upsource Accounting, we're going to get started in the next few weeks. We're launching a 10-part video series um, for our agency owners. It's going to focus on hitting that pivotal moment from like five to 10 employees and 1 million in revenue where everything changes. You realize that you need, what got you here isn't going to take you there and get you um, to that next step. So we've pulled together some experts and um, we're going to be hosting that on YouTube. So if you are interested, uh, Hop on YouTube, check us out, and subscribe to our channel. Subscribe. Yeah. Um, if you guys have any questions in the meantime, um, the the guy's um, email address is are listed here, and we will also send a follow up with all of this information from today. Great. So, thank you all for. Thanks, everybody. Again. Thanks so much. It's fun. All right. Take care.